I am incredibly excited to say that we have just finished installing Norwood Viviano's um, new exhibition called Recast Cities. Um, and uh, we are, um, we have it in the gallery. It is live here and Norwood is here as well. He's sitting actually right behind me in the center gallery. Um, so uh, welcome Norwood. And I am also delighted um, to welcome um, Sarah Darrow. Um, hi, Sarah. Um, Sarah very kindly agreed um, a few months ago to write an essay about this latest project of Norwood's Recast Cities. She is a curator and a writer. We have been thrilled with the essay. The essay is um, as listed as part or it is, it is part of our catalog. And I'm also very happy to welcome Susie Silbert. Um, Susie is, a, as we know, is the curator at the Corning Museum of Glass. She um, is somebody who has been a very early proponent of Norwood's work, has curated his work into exhibitions, uh, help me Susie, maybe 10 years or for 10 years now. She um, actually wrote an essay for an earlier exhibition of ours um, of Norwood's um, that was called Mining Industries. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to ask Susie actually to start today because she will show us a little bit about the history um, of Norwood's career or the trajectory of Norwood's career. So we will start with Susie. Good. I'm so happy to be here um, with you and talking about Norwood. And listen, it's a, it's a, a getting to know Norwood, a little short history, completely 100% partial history, not exhaustive, not a retrospective. And I couldn't get it in five slides, but I was trying to. So anyway, it's close. Um, so I, I first became aware of Norwood's work when I was in grad school at the Bard Graduate Center. And this show, City's Departure in Deviation, was on view at the Heller Gallery. And it was one of those pieces where I was like, oh, this is a different way to think about the material and to think about what's happening. And I thought it was amazing. And then, and you'll notice it is now happily in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, so plug. Um, and then I was super lucky um, to put it into an exhibition co-curated by me and the lovely Anna Walker um, at Houston Center for Contemporary Craft a couple of years later. Um, a show called Sprawl that was all sorts of different takes on the city and on cities over time. So you can see the sort of range of work in that exhibition. And um, in one of the personal highlights of my career that had nothing at all to do with me at all, um, uh, Norwood's piece went from there to um, the Venice Biennale of Architecture, which just is so freaking cool. And um, it's totally worthy venue for, uh, for that work. Then as Katya just mentioned, um, she invited me to write an essay about this work, um, the, the mining industries, which is kind of a, a direct ancestor of the work um, that is in the galleries now. And it was such a treat for me in this time in my career where I was an independent curator, I was teaching history of glass at RISD, um, to think about the use of glass and the use of cities as a, as a, a, a way to hold histories and to hold, um, a, and to hold memory. Um, so on the top is the cities as they're built now. And then in between the layers of glass were transparencies, um, stitching together uh, views of that same location uh, at various points in time. And then those would be reflected in the mirror below, which in this image, I like how starry um, that reflection comes back. So the history ends up with, uh, ends up um, taking on new meanings and being presented in sort of new ways. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of background. Then, then here's some pieces that I, this is Global Cities. This is an incredible work. It's the next piece in a series um, in that Cities Departure and Deviation series that was in my show in Sprawl. I will, I will interrupt you just for a second. But Cindy Strauss posted in the chat that the um, Cities Departure and Deviation is currently on view um, at, um, in Houston um, in their kind kinder building for modern and contemporary art. After an appropriate quarantine, come to Corning 
and see global cities, um, which is not on view in this space, but listen, I don't want to blow up my spot. It's coming in the deck. Um, this piece was in um, the show that Norwood was in at the Renwick um, at the Smithsonian, um, their triennial. And then I was so happy once I joined Corning in 2017. I was just thinking about this. I think this might have been the first like major acquisition that I made when I got to Corning. And it is, um, you know, it is, it's, I guess, listen, listen, here we all are a year into pandemic. We've been in this like virtual space. I will just share, with, I will overshare with you. I am now getting to be, you know, of a certain age. I probably am not supposed to share my age now that I'm getting to that age, but I'm about to be 40. And that actually means that I've been working in glass for more than half of my life. Huh. And um, to look at, you know, somebody like Norwood, where we've kind of grown up together is an impressive thing to be a, it's impressive to me, it doesn't have to be impressive to you. Anyway, it's personally meaningful um, to be at this stage and looking at this work develop over time. So Global Cities came to Corning, and this was its original display in our special projects gallery. And then um, we were just, 100%, 150% delighted to add um, Mining Industries piece. I see it's a little cut off. Mining Industries, um, Corning, which is a super gracious gift of um, Jim Flaws and Marsha Weber to the museum. And it shows um, Corning, and you can see in the image on the right, there's Little Joe Tower and uh, headquarters, uh, Corning Incorporated Global Headquarters and across the river, and to the right, the top right is the museum. Um, so super powerful piece made even more powerful in the reinstallation of our Crystal Cities Gallery, which um, was beautifully curated by my former colleague, Kelly Conway. And we are right now, right now, fresh off the presses, reinstalling global cities in a new place and in a new context. So these are images from my phone, friends, and um, as I'm sitting on the floor watching the team put up the vinyl of what's happening in the galleries right now. Um, and to just close this little trip down memory lane, to give you a sense of where in the galleries, it's going into what has been our nature gallery. And I am so pleased to include Norwood's work, which really looks at place and looks at, at time and situates ourselves in it, shows people, um, people, urban development, and um, as part of the natural systems. And I will say that in part, this, um, I think, really prescient and beautiful location for this piece is the work of the lovely Sarah Darrow, who um, was uh, uh, doing a fellowship at the museum um, over the last uh, year or so. So with that, um, thank you guys for letting me interlope on this um, on on this uh, presentation and show you a little bit of um, Norwood's work over time and the work that leads up to where we're at now. Well, thank you, Susie, for being such a great proponent for this work um, and a fantastic spokesperson for it too. Um, I'm gonna pass the um, word to Norwood, um, who will show us a little bit about the work that he's been doing on the current project. Let me start from the beginning. So in this body of work, and this is something that I uh, was just thinking about and looking at as I was setting up the show, I think that there's a couple of different strategies, and you'll see that these objects are very different from the mining industry's work that Susie showed. But I think that there's work that's very specifically driven towards infrastructure and relationship between infrastructure. And then there's objects that are um, more, they're still industrial, uh, but they're more kind of domestic focused. And so um, I'll just run through these quickly so you can get an idea. And of course, I'm working with color in a really different way here. I'm working with um, glass, I would say, in a, in a different way than I was working with it in the mining industry series. The objects uh, give me that opportunity because they have different shapes and different thicknesses. And of course, then, then you know, the idea of using material that can really work in compelling ways with those shapes um, gives me a lot of opportunities within the work. So this is 
uh, recasting Detroit um, on top of the V8 engine block. And I will just add that in most of these pieces and not all of them, uh, as I was sort of composing them, because I think about them as compositions as much as I think about them as objects and, and through the process, I was thinking about most of them as fragments. So, you know, rather than, and this isn't true of all of them because as the project evolved that, that I could, it wasn't a hard and fast rule, but thinking about the idea of a fragment in relationship to an industrial past became an important kind of strategy as I was thinking about also the future of the city. So this is Pittsburgh on steel blue glass. Houston, and I think Houston is a city that's tied to a lot of infrastructure um, without cities like Houston, um, industries like the automobile industry and, and um, the steel industry and a whole host of industries that are interrelated couldn't exist. This is Portland. So this is a reference to the early lumber industry in Portland, which of course was a really significant industry across the West Coast. And so this is a Douglas fir tree. And, and one of the things that I do in the work um, is I use uh, this process called LIDAR, which is a 3D imaging technology where they use lasers to capture the landscape. And so within this piece, I actually 3D scanned the stump, used a 3D um, point cloud of the LIDAR for the city and put those together in the computer and this whole object was 3D printed. I don't think it's important that people necessarily know that my work is done with, with digital technology, but it can't really be done without it. Even though these objects are very much handmade, you know, the only way to output kind of the, the, urban, um, the urban landscape imagery is through 3D printing and LIDAR. So this is New York sitting on 18 uh, New York Times. You know, going back to New York is maybe a, a link to that um, space between kind of the domestic and what I was talking about earlier, this idea of infrastructure. Um, this is Philadelphia. So a reference to the early furniture industry in Philadelphia. This was actually an object that was made in Philadelphia in the early 1800s. And at the time this looking glass was made, there were about 12 merchants all within, you know, about a six block radius selling um, these Philadelphia style uh, looking glass. And, I, and I, one of the things that I think about with this project in particular is that the work is kind of like, this is a metaphor in some ways for what the work does. You know, the idea of this is a looking glass kind of looking back at and also looking forward at place. Um, this is recasting Toledo. So basically kind of, um, I think Sarah talked about this in her essay, this idea of hole punching, you know, the landscape. And so this is 16 glasses with a landscape of Toledo on top. And I also think that Sarah did a nice job of talking about this idea of how glass in particular was a material that went across, you know, the you know, domestic space and industrial space. And um, this is uh, recasting white mills. So this is uh, the, a reference to um, Dorflinger. And so I wanted to just give a shout out to James Esseltine who um, loaned me the, the bowl from the Dorflinger Factory Museum. Um, but I think that for me, uh, this, these two glass projects are really important to this exhibit because not only was I working in glass, but I think this sort of reference to glass history and the way the glass crosses over is really significant. And so um, I think it's important to kind of have these objects. This is hand cut. This was originally hand cut glass. So obviously that reference references a very specific time. The Toledo piece is actually, um, you know, mold made glass, pressed glass. And so um, that references a different kind of time period, a different kind of worker and a different kind of expectation. Um, in some ways they're kind of referencing the same thing, but they're also made in really different ways. The one thing I was going to add quickly um, is that um, the Dorflinger project and the Toledo project were both influenced by a residency that I did 
uh, at Corning, which was the David White House Research Residency. So when I was there doing research in 2018, um, I spent a lot of time researching Libby Glass, uh, who made the, the Hopstar glasses. But I had the opportunity to actually go down to the Dorflinger Museum, meet with Jim, and you know he's incredibly passionate about the Dorflinger story. And I think that these objects are kind of meant to also embody some of that story as well. And I'll just um, add quickly, I did a project for uh, an exhibit at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. And uh, Grand Rapids has a really long history of furniture. Uh, nowadays, uh, it is Carmen Miller, Steelcase, and Hayward. Uh, but there were over 100 furniture factories in Grand Rapids in the early 20th century. Most of them, most of the workforce was an immigrant uh, workforce. And so this object was actually made in the 40s, just as the furniture industry was peaking. You know, um, it basically, it, it basically kind of uh, disintegrated in the 60s and then was picked up later. But um, this was an object that was made for the exhibit and then was later acquired by the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Um, I'm just gonna interject for one moment, just to say that that piece is the only piece from this series that is not included in the exhibition here because, um, because of the situation with the pandemic, we didn't wanna risk the object traveling from yeah. Grand Rapids to New York and back again, so. That's, uh, thank you, Katja. So, but, but you can go see it at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Um, and I was just going to add quickly that, uh, you know, with all of these projects, and you can sort of see behind me that there's a kind of a, a vinyl graphic that references an earlier time period. Um, and the work is very much about place. Uh, it talks of, it, it's very much about how the landscape has changed over time. Um, I grew up in the city of Detroit, so I witnessed a lot of transformation of the landscape of Detroit. But then I now live in a, in a post paper mill town, uh, a little town in Michigan. And so uh, in the last 15 years of living there, I've also witnessed that, that power dynamic between industry and community. And uh, for me, that's like the, one of the real significant things that I'm always thinking about within this work is how that power dynamic plays out, what our role is and, and as community partners or members, what kind of responsibility we have in that. That's great. Thank you, Norwood. And we probably should afterwards go to a little bit of the technical um, sure. um, to address a little bit of your making process, because there have been already some questions about that. But um, why don't we let Sarah um, uh, tell us a little bit about herself and about her project? Uh, it's wonderful to see so many faces here today. Thank you for being with us. And I wanted to just begin by thanking Katya and Norwood for inviting me to write about recast cities. Um, the politics of space and infrastructure and architecture over time have really been a through line through both my academic work and my curatorial practice. So it was a really rich experience to be able to apply the lens of that research background onto Norwood's work. Um, so I'm really excited to see where the conversation takes us and also to have um, brilliant glassy thinker and my mentor in the field, Susie here uh, on the call as well. So please blow up our conversation box because um, we want to hear from everyone. So I thought I'd introduce myself very briefly with a couple of case studies of papers I've written and exhibitions I've curated that have centered on architecturally influenced design and the agency of objects and spaces on people. Um, when I started to put these slides together, I realized that a lot of the architectural theory and material studies um, ontology that informed my thinking about Norwood's work uh, was born out of two academic theses I did um, for visual anthropology and art history. Um, and in my undergrad thesis, these are each of the thesis side by side. Um, I staged a critical comparison between earthship architecture in the late 1970s, uh, born out of the environmentalism movement. These are self-sufficient off the grid DIY folk structures and the domestic architecture of the 1940s and 50s um, that are born out of Cold War anxieties and um, kind of building these domestic bunkers. Um, so I argued that earthships were reprising the material systems and logics 
of survivalism that um, was used in this dom domestic bunkering architecture, but reframing the nuclear enemy as an apocalyptic environmental threat. Um, so in both intent and physical composition, there are a descents of that militarized past. So on the left, you can see Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion homes, which were used both on the war front and then also um, retrofitted um, as domestic spaces um, and fallout shelters. But um, these are all built from grain bins um, and industrial materials. And the earthships were uh, kind of co-opting Buckminster's um, theories um, and material use of, ref of refuse and industrial materials and applying that to the um, results of consumerism and capitalism. So using tires, cans to build these spaces. Um, and I was kind of applying both of these things to Martha Rossler's work, um, which was um, showing through these collages how we build civilian soldiers in the home. Um, so how domestic architecture is really not so um, benign necessarily. Okay. And then I went back for my master's thesis. Um, I had been living off the grid, um, studying earth ships. And then I went back to study these off the grid retrofitted school bus homes um, that had kind of carried on the, <clears throat> the Ken Casey psychedelic acid trip tradition, um, but moved them off the grid. So I was studying the iconology and the theater and the artwork of these painted buses and how they retrofitted them into architecture, moving architecture, and then how that's transformed over time through these oral histories. So moving into my curatorial practice, I've done a couple of shows that um, were completely founded on uh, the idea of makers and architects working together in some cases, um, but building objects and home interior home design objects that were influenced by architecture. So this show was done at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft, um, and it was inspired by the immense proliferation of uh, postmodern architecture in the city. Um, and many of the artists in this show were drawing, I, I noticed were drawing from the, the aesthetics of that work um, and using materials in a similar way, um, you know, using laminates and um, other new materials to mimic stone and natural materials, um, but maybe doing it in this case with water marbling um, rather than laminate <clears throat> and um, ceramic surfaces rather than plastic. Um, the top left image is from Cindy Strauss, who I think is on this calls, um, Radical Italian Design Show at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, she was really in my mind while I was putting this show together too and gave me a lot of resources um, while I was working on it. Um, but just this kind of playful, energetic, um, monumental, um, jovial uh, experimentation with architecture. And these are three postmodern buildings in Houston. I ended up extending the show um, and doing a mobile exhibition that was inspired by this Cite boxing ring. Um, and I moved it into all of the buildings. Um, to really frame the work within uh, the architectural context. Uh, the last show I did, most recent show I did, um, was called Total Work of Art at Spring Break Art Show in New York. And this one was thinking about the Werner Werkstatt and Gitter work and the idea of infusing ornamentation into the functional surfaces of work. Of So I have... Um, Joseph Hoffman and Otto Wagner, and then uh, contemporary artists, weavers, um, ceramicists who are doing very similar things um, materially and ideologically. So then 
coming back to Norwood's work when I was asked to do this wonderful essay, um, the Dymaxian project and the Dymaxian map came to my mind. Um, I was thinking about how um, Norwood's doing a really interesting and radical reconsideration of cartography. Um, not only by blurring the boundaries between the cast objects that support the maps, but also by in the, the Toledo piece physically separating and inc incorporating voids. Um, and it reminded me of um, Fuller's map, which you could take apart and it was actually designed to be kind of like a cut and paste game in, the, in Life magazine. And it was wildly radical at the time because you could finally compose views of earth that were not one not distorted like the mercator map um but uh didn't just didn't prioritize uh, a western centric viewpoint so <clears throat> i was thinking about that a lot when i was looking at recasting toledo um not only can the glasses be moved in perpetuity they're not connected, they have voids. Um, there's just something really interesting about the possibilities in this work. And then <clears throat> thinking about his display and the way that it moved from mining industries, which had these you know, kind of self-contained layers of cartographic information um, and are moving into these displays that you know involve the walls the ceilings the floor i was thought i it brought to mind um some writings i read by sam gilliam about the way his um his gravitational paintings needed to involve all of these spaces not only to um reflect the process that they were made in but to enmesh the viewers in it I was thinking a lot about the production of space by Henri Lefebvre and experimental uh, geography and critical cartography literature when I was writing this essay. Um, and I think there's there's much more I would like to, to ask Norwood and to bring up um, once everybody has read the essay. So that that is actually the Houston piece. I'll, can we leave it on the screen for just a second? I'm just going to read this the, the, one of the wonderful sentences from this essay, which describes this piece. Um, and it's towards the end of um, Sarah's description of recasting Houston. She says the energy industry that is represented by the crude oil barrel at the base determines the shape, scope, and population trends of the in infrastructure at its surface. Um, and the shape of the map at its surface is determined by the data fed by that very industry. Oh, here, in recasting Houston, the city's map is ruptured by the steel ring cap of, oil, of the oil barrel. At that scale, the concave divot looks uncannily like a stadium arena that might house howling fans and sports teams named after titans of industry, the oilers perhaps. The exposed barrel cap has profound conceptual implications for Viviano's critical cartographic project. Its presence uh, forces the viewer to question the objectivity of cartographic space by bringing awareness to the aberrations, the boundaries, and the physical voids. Recast Cities exposes how data is intentionally schematized, indexed, and framed in map making. Sarah Darrow. Nice work there, everybody, Norwood and Sarah. Um, so I'm going to start with a question that you, Sarah, um, sent for Norwood. And it is, um, Norwood, in mining industries, your use of clear glass and mirrors reveals other layers of, car of cartography. The sculptures became almost self-contained archaeocartographic sites. Can you talk a little bit about your use of colored glass in recast cities? I, I, I think that there's a certain amount of analytics to the way the glass, the color has been used in the glass. For example, I made an earl, earlier uh, version of recasting Detroit, which I used green glass for, and I was thinking a lot about the idea that, you know, the reason why uh, the glass
glass was green is because of the iron content in the glass. Uh, as this project evolved, I started thinking more about how the glass, the color within the glass um, became a reference to what the material used to be or what the object used to be. So I think that there was an evolution of the way that I thought about how the color could be connected to the concept within the glass um, or the concept within the work, you know? So, you know, it, it was, uh, it made absolute sense in the Toledo project to make it in clear because I wanted it to reference the original glasses and I wanted the city to feel like it was basically water sitting on top of the glasses. So um, that was, you know, that was, but, but some of the other pieces I think um, were somewhat intuitive. I made the uh, Pittsburgh piece out of uh, gaffer glass steel blue. So it was when I, when I opened up the catalog for um, the gaffer glass, I said, well, I mean, some of the pieces here are made in bullseye and some of them are made in, in uh, gaffer, but I, I opened up the catalog and I saw steel blue, even though it's not really gray it just made sense to kind of move forward. And so I think that there's um, a, a fair amount of analytics within the project, but I also think it's a fair amount of intuition and in trying to trust some of my choices in terms of how those things are referenced, referencing back to the original object. And Norwood, can you maybe say a little bit about the Dorflinger project because that actually has a special kind of use of color there? So within this project, um, so the, the Dorflinger bowl wasn't quite cut at the hemisphere. Uh, I made the mold and I made two molds and then I cold worked the project. The cold piece of the project was cold worked together. So that, you know, so that the pattern was in some ways disrupted, but still continuous. Um, but the green functions for me in a couple of ways. One is uh, the, the original Dorflinger factory um, and I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but this is the Dorflinger factor here. You can sort of see the little smokestack or chimney. Much of the factory is gone and it's been sort of overtaken by the landscape. And so I think that the, the color green is, is a way of kind of talking about the transformation of that landscape, but it's also references some of the, you know, Dorflinger um, was important for a couple of reasons. One, because they made exquisite objects you know, they're cut to clear and um, objects are some of the most sought after um, early American glass objects. And so a lot of them were cut to clear from green. Um, so they were cut away. So they removed a certain amount of the green color and then they became clear. Um, and, and through that, I think through that reference, it's, it's important as well. I think it's interesting um, how you, spoke about each of the objects working as fragments of an industrial past and how, um, you know, looking to the future, um, what can these spaces look like? Um, what responsibility do these industries have to the communities? Is there a way that you set parameters or create a system of logic when you're working? Um, you know, not only with color, but, you know, I, I spoke a lot in the essay about the kind of directional decision making that happens once you decide what the what the cast piece on the bottom is going to be and how that um, determines the shape and um, scope of the map at the surface. Um, is that how, how do you work with, do, do parameters work for you in your creative practice? I know for some people setting rules and logic kind of, and then pushing against that. I think that I don't have hard, fast rules, um, but at the same time, I think there's a fair amount of consistency. So um, I, I wanna, I guess, go back to so, a couple of things Susie was talking about, or it, at least it showed through some of her, her images, you know, so there's, blown glass work that's very analytical that talks about population change, which of course references a landscape and how we use the landscape. And then we have these objects which are more, um, more 
illustrative of what the landscape looks like, but then you have kind of parameters on these objects because they either have a scale to them or they have a shape to them. And so a lot of what I'm doing, and in particular in this project, I did a lot of like, well, I've got a, I've got a composition, I have a scale. I wanna make sure that people understand what this place is, even though it's a fairly small object. Um, you know, the, the river, which was at one time a canal, um, is a really significant part of that landscape, but also was, was likely a pretty significant part of that industry. And so, um, you know, that's an important part of the story. I mean, if you want to call it sort of a story, and I think about um, all of these objects, like none of these objects, when I make work, I'm often working as an artist who's working on a project. So, you know, I'll probably work on this project for another several years. Um, and so these objects can exist autonomously, but I think when they exist together, they begin to kind of talk about how these industries were related together, how they were connected either through, you know, the fact that they're domestic, domestically used objects or an industry needed you know, the raw material or, or the fuel from Houston to, you know, talk about its, its ability to produce. Um, but I feel like a lot of times I'm, you know, I'm in the computer when I'm working on like the initial research, looking at the landscape as a LIDAR, you know, which was, you know, very, very much a virtual space, but because I make these things with my hands, I'm always thinking about, you know, well, well, how heavy are they going to be? Can I really finish this the way I think it should be finished? You know, what are the physical constraints or parameters that are necessary for this work to be made? And, um, you know, fortunately, I was able to, um, to, to reference back to the original Dorflinger object, I was able to get this project acid polished. So, you know, even as a cast object, it is, um, you know, able to reference back to that original, you know, the original hand cut object. So I don't know if that fully answers your question. I think it's a really good question. And um, my answer would also be that each object, because there's a certain amount of kind of grafting of the landscape onto the, you know, whatever that fragment is, and you referenced how I did it with Houston, where there's the, you know, what looks like a stadium, but it's really part of the oil drum. Like each one of the objects has a little bit of a different kind of tactic there. Um, I'm gonna see if, you know, so in the New York project, I actually, you know, did a lot of wax work to this um, and basically fabricated a big part of that top layer to make that landscape really look like it was you know, coming out of that newspaper. You know, that shape was very much shaped by hand, even though that 3D print was made by a computer. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, and this is stuff I really love doing. So, you know, and, and I can have an idea and an intention, but when you put those two things together, there's a, like an aha moment. And then sometimes it's like, oh my God, what was I thinking, you know? And how do I, how do I negotiate that as an artist? And I think every project has a slightly different, um, you know, a, I have a slightly different response within every project on how I kind of move forward with that. Yeah, I think the, the convergence points in this work was, that was my first entry when I was writing. I found it like that was where so much of the critical potential in the work lied. Um, you know, making the viewer really aware that cartography is totally constructed and like um, it's not this God's eye view of a space. It's not fixed, it's constantly changing. And I think that all of those, um, all of those elements of the work formally bring the viewer into, into that thought process. I was also, um, something came to me while you were talking about just the interconnectedness of the industries and how the pieces together tell this very um, complicated and entangled portrait about, about American industry um, and how the raw materials and the objects in each city have 
you know, a lot of material history and ties. Um, and I was thinking, obviously, with glass, um, there's a, a part in that essay where we talk about how glass um, has a specific relationship to all of these cities. Um, but then, like you were saying, the petroleum in Houston connected to the auto industry in Detroit. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to any of these kind of new ontologies about like petroculture and how everything um, that we do is in modern culture is really born out of this material need uh, for petroleum. Um, you know, it's in all of us. Um, it's in all of the work. It fuels glass um, melting, you know. Um, I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that. I went down a deep K-hole um, when, when I was researching this and I, the, the amount of connection between all of our material surroundings and um, the industries was just, it was compelling. You know, it's like mm -hmm. the fillings in my teeth are made from the same things that you're 3D printing with and like all of these things and they're all made out of petroleum industry. Well, I think it permeates everything we do. You know, I mean, the mask I have sitting here is is some kind of fleece nylon material, which is a petroleum product. Yeah. Um, my glasses are plastic. I mean, everything has some some reach to the petroleum industry. So again, it permeates everything. I mean, I think it's it's easy to kind of like, you know, assume the relationship between Detroit. And, and the automobile industry, but it isn't just like the automobile, the, it isn't just that oil was necessary to power, um, to, to power the, the automotive, uh, the, the automobiles when they were made, after they were made, but it very much powered a lot of the processes to make them. So um, I think that there's a whole, a whole bunch, this isn't probably a segue, but it's something I meant to say earlier related to the Dorflinger project. One of the things that I think was interesting about Dorflinger was that, you know, they made these very exquisite objects, but they also made blanks for a whole host of other cutting factories or cutting companies. And so, you know, one of the things that I think, again, it talks about interesting about their history is that, you know, they, they lasted until about 1920. Um, and I think it's, it talks about the relationship of how that industry shifted and the, the, you know, like the need or the lack of need um, for those blanks that were being cut by everybody else. And then the shifting to, um, you know, a more automated process for a lot of those, um, those kinds of goods. So, you know, like I, I you know, the Dorflinger being, you know, a hundred years ago now, but I, I think about um, how an industry like that, you know, was so, you know, as a company, they were so interconnected to that whole field and then, you know, basically disappeared from that. Um, it's a really good question, Sarah. I think, um, I think the only piece in the show that isn't really tied to that question would be the Philadelphia piece because it was made, you know, um, the original piece was made um, over 200 years ago. And so, you know, it was made out of very much hand-sawn material. You could see all of that in the original object that I used. And some of that kind of carries itself through into the glass object as well. So Sarah, when you talk about um, in your essay and, um, you know, it's been mentioned in other writing about Norwood's work, um, about term, when you use terms like geocritical or, and cardocritical, um, and mapping as an active iterative process that is continually negotiated over time. Can you explain that a little bit more? Can you talk about that just a little bit so that everybody here understands where we are with that? That this is not just a given, that a map is not just a given set of information? Yeah, um, I, I was, um really influenced by Trevor Paglin's experimental geography um, book. And 
Um, obviously, Henri Lefebvre's um, production of space when I was thinking about mapping. Uh, in a lot of this uh, geocritical and cardocritical literature that I was re reading um, in preparation to write this essay, they were making a distinction between what they called tracings, which um, are a seemingly um, exact representation of a, of a space at a given time and mappings, which are these very dynamic, um, active spaces that have thick surfaces filled with history and they're constantly being reworked um, and rebuilt and uh, dug up and mined. And Norwood is doing the latter. You know, it's he's not just taking um, LIDAR scans of these spaces, he's incorporating so much rich, um, research and layers of information, cartographic and geographical information and all of his bodies of work, he, he does this in some way, but by making them, showing them to the, to the viewer, not hiding them, um, it is engaging all of us in this very critical project, um, which shows us that we're all building maps, we're all you know, we're all engaged in this uh, actualizing new geographies uh, by our movement through our material surroundings um, and the way that and the way that we map make. So, um, I I just wanted to, you know, point that out in the essay that there's these thick, rich layers of cartographic research um, behind Norwood's pieces um, and. You know, he's enveloping you within these, with you know, between the Sanborn insurance maps and these um, historic aerial photography um, maps. Um, and then, you know, all of this really data driven LIDAR scanning, too. Yeah, just to bring that to a slightly different, to, to bring it to the very physical, I noticed um, this week um, as we're installing global cities in the galleries how much of it, you know, adapting it to this new space is like Norwood has, it's a performance. Norwood has implicated us in yeah. map making, you know, that I am like, I am calling, you know, I have his outlines, but I am calling like what the map is and what it should be. And I have recognized, you know, that I'm doing that, but to think of it as the way Sarah has just framed it and, and thinking, you know, it, it reframes. And for me, like I've never thought of Norwood's work as in any way performative, but he is making me and our fabulous prep team like perform cartography. Um, so it's a, a pretty interesting thing. Just wanted to share. I think we're getting some really great comments on this. So I'm just going to read them off. Carol White is saying, as Sarah was mentioning, the relationship between petroleum and the auto industry. I flashed on the relationship between the timber industry in, represented in, by Portland and the paper stack of the New York Times supported by Manhattan, for example. Yes. Uh, somebody else said something. Oh, Larry Peterman was saying, seems like Norwood is also taking the maker um, even further into digital information technology, i.e. LiDAR 3D and marrying the uh, point of view story for each piece. Um, so yeah, that's, and, and we do have a few questions about um, the technical side of this, Norwood. Um, Antonio is asking, um, what is the computer program you are using and what kind of printer fantastic work? My computer may die here, so. Uh -oh. Are there parts of the essay that surprised you in a positive way? Does Sarah, does Sarah see things you never thought about? One of the things that, that surprised me about the essay, and I know this from working with Susie, uh, that I really appreciated the amount of research that Sarah put into the essay. Um, it was clear to me that it wasn't just a response to the work. I mean, there was certainly some of that in there, but there was a whole lot of research and connections to things within the field of craft, but also to how the work is connected to a bunch of different disciplines outside of the field of craft and so, or glass. And so, you know, as an artist who is of course connected and, um, and, and engaged in the field, I appreciate that connection, but I also really want the work to be able to uh, find its way outside of the field because these conversations are really necessary beyond the material. 
Yeah, and with, with that, we should also mention, even though we don't have an image of that right now, that in between these projects, the city um, mining industries and cities departure and deviation and recasting cities, Norwood has also made a body of work that's called Cities Underwater, which deals with even more kind of um, current and urgent, yeah. maybe not more, but also urgent um, uh, issues um, that we are dealing with. And we can, um, we'll, we'll um, send around to all of you who have participated a whole portfolio of Norwood's work and you're of course welcome to see it at any time. Also, um, the city's um, underwater is scheduled to be shown next year in Miami at the Lowell Museum. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that will happen. I'm just gonna see if there are any more questions because we are just at six o'clock. Um, I have a question about Toledo. Okay, let's sure. go. Oh yeah, sure. I, I think I know what question it is. Yeah, well, you know, just we've been talking about how this um, body of work kind of beckons and implicates the viewer in a number of ways in a performative way, like moving through the installation and being enmeshed within the cartographic layers, but also with this piece, um, I'm wondering how you envision its life after it's acquired. Um, and since all of the elements can be moved in perpetuity, do you imagine, like, is there an element of play or do you, you know? Could, could maybe 16 people buy it together? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the work takes on a, a, a life of its own outside of, you know, the, the context of making it. So there's, you know, there's a lot of different lenses you could put on this. One is that there's a rationale, a rational way of thinking about the urban landscape and that it fits together a certain way. But there's also from like stripping back the layers of the urban landscape, you sort of realize that there's, there were a lot of decisions that were really made 100 years ago by somebody who wasn't thinking about what we would be doing now or how we would be interacting now. And so I would be okay if somebody put the water in the middle of Toledo, you know, the, 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 the hot star glass that's primarily water could go somewhere else. And maybe it's a becomes a tool for rethinking how that landscape is used, you know, so yeah. it can be playful, it can be educational, it can be a, a lot of ways of kind of interpreting the landscape. I mean, I think it's a great, um, it becomes a really good tool for not thinking about the landscape being sort of like this, this data set that can't be moved or can't be, that is completely inflexible. Okay, well, we are going to have to, we are at the end, we are going to have to go here, but thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Susie. Thank can you, I, Sarah. And thank you, Norwood. Norwood. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Doug and Katja and Sarah and Susie. It is a tremendous gift to have the time and the advocacy. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Have a good night. Yes, thank you. Good night, everyone.